just like you couldn't boycott the fall at Colvin, and you had to wait for somebody like Rosa Parks, the same thing is true about making sure everybody gets to work. If you don't, it's going to be very easy for white racists in Montgomery to say, oh, yeah, well, they're just boycotting because black people are lazy. They're just doing this because they don't want to go to work. You have to make sure there's no way the racists can say anything to get leverage. How do you do that? You can't ride the bus. Well, these <laughs> are essentially what is a massive carpool. Over 200, this is not just a little car, over 200 cars. Anybody who had a car donated its use to get everybody in Black Montgomery to and from work every single day. And you might say, wow, that's a big undertaking. Uh, that, that's going to that's gonna be inconvenient for a, a few days. But the bus boycott does not last for a few days. The bus boycott lasts 381 days. More than a year of this carpool happening every single day to make sure that nobody rides the bus and everybody gets to and from work. It is a, an undertaking like we have never seen before. And it crippled the bus system of the government. Of course, you know, the people who ride the buses are the people who can't afford cars. They are the working class. They are the poor. And in Montgomery in the 1950s, the majority of the poor are black, which means that more than 65% of everybody who rides the bus, at least before the boycott, is black. Which means if you don't have those customers, it's going to be hard to keep the buses operational. To maintain Montgomery lays off drivers, they cut routes, they do everything they can to try to keep public transportation, but the whole entire system is completely crippled by this boycott. And of course the other problem here for White Montgomery is that if you ride the bus, if you have transportation wherever you want to go, you go and shop in the stores downtown, you go and you know, you don't just leave your house to go to work. You also have to go shopping, do other things. Black Montgomery was not going to the white-owned stores downtown that they normally went to shop because the car doesn't take you to go shopping. The car will take you to get to work and back every day. And so Black Montgomery is shopping in their own neighborhoods. They are avoiding white-owned stores in the process because they don't have easy access to them without the buses. And so you have this weird situation where white business owners downtown are actually trying to tell the city government to integrate the buses. It's not because they're forward thinking, it's not because they're pro-civil rights or anything like that. They just want their money. They just want the business that they are losing because of the boycott. Finally, it all becomes too much. And in December of 1956, Montgomery integrate the bus. And the boycott is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it demonstrates the economic clout of the black South. It had always been assumed by every black leader of the 20th century at this point that you really can't have that kind of sustained economic attack on racism because the vast majority of the black South is poor. The black middle class, which we talked about earlier in the semester, is located largely in urban areas in the north and in the west. In the south, it's mostly a rural population, it's mostly a poor population. The assumption is you can't really have any economic impact when you essentially have an apartheid system in the south. There's no way to do that. But it turns out in areas like buses, where the majority of the money comes from poor riders, it comes from black riders, the black population can have a severe economic impact on a community. Maybe one activist can, but if everybody pulls their resources, the black population of Montgomery was a gigantic economic force and for the first time demonstrated that if everybody's on the same page, 
We can cripple an entire city economically. Very important because it's going to be used again and again. You have to realize it doesn't matter if you have a million dollars or two dollars. If the bus costs ten cents to ride, everybody can have that impact. You know, it doesn't matter how much other money you have in the bank. You still affect change with the money you would be spending. Second, on top of that, it proves the power of this kind of protest. Everything we see at this point is largely built on legal action, is built on Supreme Court cases, is challenging these things to the court. And certainly, um, after the boycott starts, the NAACP files a lawsuit in court, and ultimately um, the court rules that the bus system is unconstitutional. They, they do all that stuff too. But this time, it's not just a court case. This time, it demonstrates the power of actual protest. This is the first successful example of civil rights action that doesn't start in the courts, that is an on-the-ground movement, and uses the media more than the courts to get what it wants. Finally, number three, the McCormick Box boycott is important because it elevates a local minister to national promise. <coughs> Martin Luther King was from Atlanta. He had, uh, uh, he was the son and grandson of activist Baptist preachers in Atlanta. So he goes to Morehouse and then goes up to Boston University for his PhD. <laughs> has opportunities up there to become a, a teacher, a theology teacher, which you normally do with a, a PhD. Uh, but he chooses not to. The legacy of his family is come back down south and preach, and that's what he does. He takes a pastorship at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. Uh, Martin Luther King was not the creator of the Montgomery Bus Boycott or anything like that. There are established preachers in Montgomery who have always been there, who are leaders in the community. Martin King is pretty much a new guy there. He hasn't been there for very long. Um, but the leader of all of this, a guy named E.D. Nixon, who you don't really need to remember specifically, um, will see his talent and decide to put him as kind of the figurehead of the boycott. And uh, Martin Luther King will be the guy who makes the speeches. He'll be the guy that rallies the truth. He'll be the guy that um, is in the media constantly. He becomes the face of the Montgomery Bus Boycott, which is a national and international story. And ultimately, it takes this guy, this relatively new minister in Montgomery, who not very many people had heard of, and elevates him to significant national problems. But King realizes that this kind of fame is a 15 minutes of fame kind of thing. This is the kind of thing that people are like, wow, this is amazing. I can't believe this happened. And then they forget. You know, they, they forget. I mean, this is a 15 minutes of fame kind of thing. And he realizes that if he wants to take advantage of this momentum, he can't just wait around for the next <coughs> opportunity. He needs to strike while he is still in the public eye to take advantage of this momentum and to build something bigger on top of it. And so, the boycott ends in late December of 1956. In early January of 1957, he will create a new organization designed to build off that success, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We're going to start today. You can't even see it, can you? It doesn't matter. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> what is it again? The Southern? the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, which is the kind of organization you might expect, an organization designed to fight against Jim Crow, 
to fight for voting rights. A little bit different than the other groups like NAACP and CORE, SCLC at its inception doesn't have individual members. Um, it has groups as members, other civil rights organizations, churches. It's designed to kind of coordinate activity uh, amongst all these groups. So it's not individuals, it's groups. But it is going to be the lead organization in all of the civil rights movement from 57 to 65. It is going to be the most important of all the civil rights organizations that start. And of course, its main goal is to get the federal government to act. To get the federal government to do something. That's the thing. That's the thing. If, 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 if the McDonald's was still there, and we all went there after class and we tried to integrate it, we would be breaking the Georgia law. We would be breaking a state law. If somebody murders somebody because of their race, they are murdering somebody. Murder is a state law. Every election you ever vote in is a state election. Even our presidential elections are state elections to pick electors. The federal government has very little control over these things. And if everything revolves around the state, and the state is the one propping up all these laws in the first place, you know you're not going to get change from your state government. What you need to do is to get the federal government involved. That's the only way anything is going to happen. And so the story of the first wave civil rights movement is the story of black civil rights workers in the South grabbing the federal government and just pulling them along and trying to get them on board, trying to do something to help out. And um, the federal government I mean, looks at all this, and they have to do something. I mean, with Brown, Brown II, the Southern Manifesto, uh, Emmett Till, um, uh, the bus boycott, all this stuff, civil rights become the news of the day in 54 to 57, and the federal government has to respond. They have to respond. They don't really want to. Uh, the president at the time is Dwight Eisenhower, who is a small government Republican. He doesn't want the federal government involved in anything like that. He doesn't want to participate. But you can't ignore all this stuff that we've been talking about. And so the federal government will respond to all of this in 19, early 1957 with the Civil Rights Act of 1957. This is not really where it is. You can make the phone tomorrow, remember? No. Is that awful? Okay. Well, let's just go with this one. At least we can read it. How big? Karen. Better. Yes, hold on. Let me, let me this. All right, and for those of you writing this down, please make sure you write down of 1957 at the end of that because uh, we're going to come across another civil rights law um, uh, a little bit later on. It is much different. Oh, okay. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 isn't going to do very much. If you remember earlier in the semester, we talked about the Sherman Antitrust Act when everybody was arguing for, for labor rights and the government didn't really want to give them. And so they come out with this law that's designed to placate everybody and kind of make all the poor people content, but that doesn't really do anything. They do that a lot. This is the same kind of thing. It's kind of a placebo law, which tries to let people in the South know, hey, we're working on it, we're doing something, without really doing anything. So, for example, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 um, uh, it, it, has, it has a provision that expedites voting rights lawsuits. 
Uh, so, if, so if you sue because you're denied the right to vote, it will kind of move you to the front of the line uh, in the court system. Um, it creates the President's Commission on Civil Rights. So this stuff sounds kind of good, but if you want to give people the right to vote, don't expedite their voting rights lawsuits, just give them the right to vote. Um, and the President's Commission on Civil Rights might sound good, but it has no legislative authority. It's just an advisory board that essentially just keeps the President updated on what's going on with civil rights. It doesn't have any, any it doesn't have the force of law, it doesn't have the ability to draft legislation, it doesn't have anything like that. And so the Civil Rights Act of 57 doesn't do much. It is just designed to calm everybody down, but just like the Sherman Antitrust Act, nobody was really buying that, nobody's really buying this either. And everybody understands that this is not going to be a solution to anybody's problem in the South. And so it should come as no surprise that the next major action of the Civil Rights Movement happens that very same year. It was in 1957 when we get uh, the school desegregation crisis in the greatest state of the Union, uh, Arkansas. The only state really that matters here. The only state. The greatest state on earth. Home of the hog. My beloved alma mater. <laughs> Arkansas, as much as I love it, as much as I wish I was there right now, um, we are not known for our intelligence, uh, our education, sophistication. We don't really have that kind of reputation. Um, we are known largely as hillbillies. Uh, who, you know, beat Bucky's on and uh, uh, who feel really weird and uncomfortable when they have their shirts tucked in. Right, like right now. Um, uh, you don't like that at all. Um, and so, <laughs> just here. When, so, uh, when Arkansas built Central High School in Little Rock, it was a national story. Central High School is the first high school to be on the cover of Time Magazine. This is well before there any problems there. It was a revelation. Central High School was the most, it was the nicest, most technologically advanced high school in the country. Um, and it was designed to kind of announce to the world, hey, Arkansas is going to really try this time to educate people. We're really, you know, we're going to build this really nice high school and we're going to show you that Arkansas is on the rise and that, you know, we're doing these kind of things. And, I mean, it, it's a celebrated school nationally and it's, it's one of the most important high schools in the country. The only high school in Arkansas that is, you know, up to this point, that doesn't matter at anything. Um, and so, when a federal judge ordered Little Rock to start desegregating schools, they said, start with Central High. Because they knew that as Central High went, so went everybody else. That this was the, the great example of Arkansas education, and that if Central High goes, all the other schools will go too. This is the one they want. This is a great symbol school. And so they want this one integrated first. Uh, based on that court ruling, a local civil rights leader named Daisy Bates recruits nine students, nine black students from other high schools in Little Rock, to come and integrate Central High. They become known as the Little Rock Nine. But the governor, uh, at the time, is not interested in having that happen. His name was Orville Flawless. Orville oh, Flawless, uh, interesting cat. I mean, he, he's from Northwest Arkansas, which never had slavery, uh, which is 
uh, uh, was fought for the Union, North was Arkansas fought for the Union or the Civil War, very different kind of ways in the rest of Arkansas. And he, he came up as a populist, as somebody who was fighting for farmers' rights, black and white. But once he becomes governor, his advisors essentially tell him, if you ever want to be reelected, you have to, you know, you have to kind of get on board with the whole segregation thing. Uh, very similar to George Wallace in Alabama, if you're familiar with that populist, he becomes uh, kind of a token racist as the governor. And Faubus does have, has no desire whatsoever to see um, uh, Central High integrated. So he calls out the National Guard. He positions the National Guard in front of Central High School and uses them to keep out the Little Rock Nine. Meanwhile, there are thousands of other protesters around screaming at these kids and just making them feel horrible. Well, Dwight Eisenhower, the president, might have been a small government Republican. And he might not have liked the idea of integration, which he didn't. But Eisenhower becomes president largely because he was the supreme allied commander of the European theater during World War II. He is a military man. And he believes in following order. And even though he is not a fan of government intervention, and even though he hates the idea of integration, what he hates more is the idea of people not following order. There was a federal decree by a judge that said you have to integrate, and Orville Faubus, the state governor, is using these truths to defy a federal order, and Eisenhower does not like that. And so, he is going to nationalize, he's going to federalize the National Guard, put them under his control, and instead of having them keep out the students, the National Guard will be tasked with protecting those students, getting them into school safely from those mobs that are kind of outside screaming at them, and getting and helping them to integrate the school. And that is exactly what they did. And Little Rock and I integrate the school, and they stay there for uh, that year, at least. A couple of them <laughs> stay through the whole process. Um, the father doesn't like it. He wants to figure out a way around having to keep doing this. And so the very next year, in 1958, he responds by closing the school. All of them. And just says, hey, you know, if you're going to make us integrate, we're just not going to have school. <laughs> I know, I know. And the joke is, of course, that nobody noticed. Um, but I can only make that joke because I'm from there. You're not allowed to make it. It'll take time like you. People bashing us. for are being the... Uh, uh, obvious podunk hillbillies that we are. Um, <laughs> so, um, Bob was just shut down all the schools. Now, of course, what he really does is shuts down the schools then opens up all these private schools and all the white students magically get vouchers to go to those schools for free and they just happen to be in the same buildings the public schools used to be. I mean, so essentially what he's doing is just, um, uh, trying to make this end around segregation. That goes to court too, and the Supreme Court says, no, you can't do that. In a court case known as Cooper v. Aaron, Cooper v. Aaron, <laughs> um, the Supreme Court says, you can't make any ex post facto laws that kind of maneuver around segregation. There's no way to get around segregation. That's essentially what Cooper Vieira said. You, no matter what law you pass now, you're going to have to abide by Brown from 54. You're going to have to go ahead and integrate. There's no law you can create afterwards <laughs> to get out of it. Um, and so, what we see is the exact same thing happening. Local action, creating a crisis, 
forcing the federal government to get involved. That's the, the story of all civil rights. And of course, everybody was really excited a couple of years later in 1960 when John F. Kennedy is elected president. Because he's a Democrat, because this guy is from Massachusetts, because he talks about the civil rights, he's friends with Martin King. Everybody assumes, all right, this guy is going to really start to help out. But he doesn't. Um, John Kennedy looks far more like Dwight Eisenhower than he does uh, his eventual replacement, Lyndon Johnson. Um, so Kennedy likes to talk about civil rights. He doesn't do much for them. Um, he is very conservative in that regard because his main goal as president is to fight the Cold War, is to battle communists. And he is so wrapped up in that that he loses sight of domestic policy issues like civil rights and really fails on a lot of those counts. And so once again, the federal, uh, the, the locals on the ground are going to have to grab the federal government and pull them along. And so it was, and then the same year that John Kennedy is elected, on February the 1st, 1960, a group of students from North Carolina A&T in Green, HBCU in Greensboro, North Carolina, go to a local restaurant, sit down, and ask for service. They are denied. They are denied service, but they stay there anyway. They just stay seated until finally the police come and arrest them. And this is the birth of what we know as the sit-in movement. <coughs> the sit-in will largely be the work of college students at HBCUs across the South. They will spread from Greensboro to Atlanta and Nashville in particular, but all over the South, really. Atlanta and Nashville just have a lot of HBCU students in them, so they get a lot more publicity. What year did you say that? Well, 60. This is 1960. Um, uh, the, the, the first day it starts on fe in February of 60, but it's pretty much lasts most of the year. And it is an ugly time. I mean, a lot of these students get beaten up, a lot of them get arrested, um, but it does start to work. I mean, it, it does. After all this, um, Atlanta and Nashville will both integrate their uh, local lunch counters and things like that. It does have the desired effect. Of course, college students are great for this because you guys don't have anything to lose. Um, uh, College students uh, tend to be more radical because they're learning all this new stuff and because they don't have a mortgage and don't have a lot of, you know, other things that people have that kind of make these things more risky for them. And so to really harness the power of those college kids, uh, they create a new organization designed to take the, the radicalism of college kids and to apply it uh, to the civil rights movement, a group called the Students Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, <coughs> a group that we call SNCC. The Students Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It will ostensibly be the, the college arm of SCLC, but uh, it will have its own agenda. It will be far more radical than SCLC, far more willing to go out and protest, far more willing to kind of get involved in those kinds of things. And what SNCC realizes pretty early on in the, in the sit-in process is that despite all the publicity they're getting for these sit-ins, <coughs> they're not really forcing the federal government to do anything. Like I say, 
if we go, I'll go integrate to McDonald's after class, we're breaking a state law. We're not breaking a federal law. And so they know that if they want the federal government to act, they're going to need to break a federal law to get the federal government to act. <coughs> and so, SNCC will team up with CORE, the World War II era group that we've talked about before, to create a different kind of sit-in. A sit-in that will make the federal government have to act. And the federal government really only has jurisdiction over interstate commerce. And so, they decide to have sit-in on buses. Not like local public transportation buses in Montgomery, on like Greyhound buses, buses that cross state lines. Because the moment you cross state lines, it becomes a federal issue. And so they initiate what we know as the Freedom Ride, which is essentially just sit-ins on interstate buses. An integrated group uh, of students, uh, members of CORE and SNCC, start in Washington, D.C. <coughs> Their idea is to go from Washington, D.C. down throughout the South and end up in New Orleans. That's the sense of the plan. Uh, it is thwarted along the way several times at various stops, bus stops along the way. They are beaten up, uh, often to the point of hospitalization. Um, in Anniston, Alabama, the bus that they are traveling on is firebombed by the two such plans. Uh, it is a very, very ugly ordeal that these guys have to go through. Uh, but it works. It's a federal issue now, and Kennedy, as reluctant as he is, has to do something. <laughs> but he kind of screws it up. I mean, his response is to put an undercover federal marshal on the bus. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really work, because if you're undercover, I mean, you, just, you have to get your ass beat, too. I mean, that's very old to blow your cover. I mean, the, <laughs> I mean he, the, the undercover agent actually gets hospitalized because uh, he gets beaten so bad. I mean, it doesn't... Uh, it was a good idea, I guess, but it really failed. Um, but it's also going to kind of get Kennedy involved in general. He, he segregates public housing. He helps to integrate the last two Southern universities who really haven't integrated yet, Alabama and Ole Miss. Still, though, he hasn't done very much. These are, these are all like token things. They're not big, kind of life-changing kind of events. And so more action is going to be needed. And King and the SCLC decide that that action needs to take place uh, in Birmingham, Alabama in the summer of 1963. Birmingham 63 is going to be the most violent summer of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, police there will stick dogs on children, protesters. They will open those large uh, water hoses, the fireman's water hoses on protesters. Um, four girls will be killed when the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham is bombed, when the police refuse to arrest anybody for the crime, uh, Black Montgomery protests that, and the police kill two more little girls uh, in the protest for not arresting anybody for the first bombing. Uh, it is a very ugly summer, a lot of violence, but it does exactly what King wanted it to do it becomes national and international news. Birmingham is the story in the world during the summer of 1963. And um, it gets the civil rights movement all the publicity that it wants. Finally, it forces Kennedy to go on national television. I mean, Kennedy, I mean, he can't just let this happen and not say anything. So he goes and makes, cuts into programming, makes these, this live talk on national television, and he says, uh, let's see, I have a, a quote here. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, Racial violence is retarding our nation's economic and social progress and weakening the respect with which the rest of the world regards us. Not exactly I have a dream. Um, 
It's retarding our nation's economic and social progress. It's weakening the respect with which the rest of the world regards us. There's no talk in there about what's right and what's wrong. There's no talk about justice. There's no talk about equality. Essentially, that's a fancy way of saying, stop it, you're making me look bad. <laughs> and that's what he's worried about most. Remember, we are in a cold war with Russia. <laughs> and in a cold war, the battle is to see how many of the rest of the world people like you better. That to win. The one who looks like a good guy is the winner. And Russia comes out publicly and says, hey, you might not like communism. You might not like the things that we do. But we try our best to create equality. And we certainly don't go around killing little girls because they look different than us. We don't do that. America loves to talk about being free. And yet they do stuff like this. We don't. Right. In this situation, Russia looks like the good guy. And when that happens, we start to lose the Cold War. Now, of course, don't get me wrong, Russia is killing lots of dead people, too. They're just having the decency to do it in a back alley somewhere away from a TV camera. Um, you know, if, if, you know if, you, if, you, if you do it from a TV camera like they're doing in Birmingham, it gets all over the world, it makes you look bad. Russia kills their people in pride. And so they are able to kind of use this kind of moral upper hand. And that's essentially what Kennedy is talking about in that quote. If we don't stop this, this is going to have a negative impact on our foreign economy, our foreign reputation. That's why you have to stop. Not because it's right, not because it's the, the thing to do. No, because you're making me look bad. We've got to win the Cold War. That's more important. Very frustrating. Very frustrating kind of speech. And so Martin King decides that what he needs to do is to punctuate the violence of Birmingham 63 with a special rally at the end of the summer that will um, highlight everything that has happened over the course of the, the summer protests in Birmingham. And so it was that he called for a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. A march on Washington for jobs and freedom. This is going to end up taking place on August the 28th, 1963, very end of the summer. Uh, it, is, it is at the end of all the Birmingham. So, I mean, the Birmingham stuff is happening, you know, June, July, early August. This is happening at the end of August. This is just the end of that summer. And if that sounds familiar, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, it should. This is exactly the thing that Ethel Randolph called for in 1941 at the beginning of the Second World War, which uh, Franklin Roosevelt had convinced him to call off in return for the FEPC. King decides we're going to go ahead and live up to that. We're going to go ahead and do that since it, was, since it never actually was done in 41. We're going to go ahead and play that out. We're going to go ahead and do that and use it as a kind of exclamation point on everything that has happened this summer. And so, on August 28, 1963, an integrated group of more than 200,000 descend on Washington, D.C. They march through the city. They march across the mall, down to the Lincoln Memorial, where there is a day set up and there are speakers um, all day long. There are all these speakers. Of course, the big show is, is Martin King, who is just kind of the, what everybody, who everybody's there to see. And he gets up and he gives a very good speech, uh, a very famous and important speech. But it finishes, and nobody wants it to be done. He's essentially made a, an encore call for a speech. Um, and finally, one woman in the crowd uh, shouts out, tell us about your dream, Martin. And so, after his prepared remarks, after his speech that he had written out, uh, and, and it said, Martin Luther King begins talking about his dream. And so all the part we remember from that speech 
the I have a dream stuff was all just ripped at the end. I mean, it was all just made up on the spot. Um, and that's, that's how smart he was. I mean, he just, I, you know, the prepared remarks are really good, but after they get him to kind of egg him to keep going on, he just comes up with all the I have a dream stuff at the end off the top of his head. Um, and that's the part we remember. That's the part that has the most impact. And so we get I have a dream. It is the perfect exclamation point to everything that happened in Birmingham, and it is just the kind of thing that Kennedy cannot ignore anymore. And so, in response to Birmingham, and in response to the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech, Kennedy is going to go ahead and start crafting a real civil rights law. Not one of these same placebo laws, but a real one. One that will actually do something. One that will actually change things. The problem is, he does not live long enough to finish it. Um, uh, the I Have a Dream speech is in late August, August 28th. Uh, it is in November when John Kennedy is assassinated uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and it looked to most civil rights activists like their worst nightmares had come true. Uh, Kennedy was his vice president, a guy named Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was a Democrat from Texas. So we have John F. Kennedy, hero of the world, replaced by a white Southern Democrat. And throughout history, white Southern Democrat has only meant one thing, and that is inordinate racist. And everybody's like, oh my God, we have to get LBJ now. Kennedy was doing so much, he was about to get us his law, and now we get this guy. But it turns out that LBJ is not like other white Southern Democrats. He believes in civil rights, and in fact, Lyndon Johnson will be the most important civil rights president, maybe of all time. The only possible competition he has in that regard is Abraham Lincoln, and Abraham Lincoln uh, only free slaves because he had to, not because he wanted to. So I think that Lyndon Johnson, you can make a case, Lyndon Johnson is the most important civil rights president of all time. And he believes in creating the new civil rights law. He finishes it up, finishes up Kennedy's law, and he starts to push it through Congress. Before he became vice president, <laughs> Johnson was uh, the president of the Senate, the president pro tem of the Senate, and um, was very experienced in getting things passed that he wanted passed. He had a lot of strong arm tactics that he used. And essentially what he does here is he takes it to Congress and says, this is, this is the last thing that John Kennedy wanted to do. This, is, this was his most important goal. And if you don't pass this, that means you hate our dead president, which means you hate America. Uh, and he kind of pulls one of those and says, if you love America, you have to pass this, because this is what our dead president wanted. And kind of uses this kind of bully pulpit to make that case. And it works. Even though no white southerners vote for it, everybody else does. And when Johnson is finished, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is passed. Civil Rights Act of 1964. <coughs> this isn't a placebo. This is real. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 ends all segregation in public <coughs> facilities. Well, technically, it ends segregation in public facilities associated with interstate commerce. That's just a wording issue that they have to use. It essentially ends segregation. It also bans employment discrimination. 
making sure that employers can't uh, either not hire or fire you because of your race. <laughs> On top of that, it also, for the, for the first time, uh, treats women as well. Um, Title VII of that law ends gender discrimination in hiring, uh, not in pay, uh, but uh, it's, it's an effort to at least uh, help women as well. In all aspects, the Civil Rights Law Act of 1964 is a success. It is the kind of legitimate change that people had been looking for since, um, since Brown. Since the Civil Rights Movement, quote unquote, again, this is the kind of thing that everyone had been fighting for. But there's one key element that I didn't mention when I mentioned all the things the Civil Rights Act can do. And that's both. The one thing it doesn't do is provide some kind of federal remedy for voting discrimination in the South to make sure that black Southerners have a chance to vote. That's the one thing it leaves up. And so, civil rights activists know that even though this is legitimate success, and even though they are very pleased with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, there's still a little bit more work to do because we have to get a voting rights law. How will we do it? <laughs> Who knows? Come back next week to find out. But not on Tuesday because on Tuesday we have a test. Don't leave yet.